Dustin, just turned 41, not looking a day over 21. We don't need to dwell on that. But already in your incredibly successful career, you've achieved the following. Drum roll, drum roll for me. I'll just drum roll myself. <laughs> yeah, nice. CEO and founder of Building Connected, probably one of the best known startups within the construction tech space. Went on to get acquired by Autodesk. VP of Industry Strategy for Construction at Autodesk. You go on to be a CEO again of Aware. You were then the principal of Suffolk Technologies, in my opinion, one of the best contact VCs out there. You invested in the likes of Quote to Me, Permit Flow, Mercator. List could go on. I've just chosen a few favorites there. And now, to get the pronunciation right, you're the founder and CEO of Edify. You've already raised your Series A. I can even like I can't hold my breath here. Where do we begin? I don't fully know, but all I see here is success after success. And behind the scenes, there's got to be a whole journey that people have never seen or never experienced themselves. So to kick off, I want you to be a bit vulnerable here. I'd love to understand the unique stresses and pressures of basically founding your own company and getting to where you've got today. Uh, wow. When you read the resume, I, I feel like it sounds better than uh, than I think about and reflect on it because when you found a company, there's so many failures along the way. Um, it kind of makes you doubt yourself. Um, you know, Building Connected was the first company I started and uh, I had no idea what it meant to be a CEO. And truthfully, when I started Building Connected, I, was, I started working on it when I was 28 and I quit my job when I was 29. I, w I wasn't ready to be a CEO. Um, I rose to the occasion. Uh, to the occasion, um, that was just a very, very tough journey. It was before investors started uh, putting money in construction tech. I used to go pitch uh, venture capitalists, and they didn't get it. The best I could ever hope for was they remodeled a home. And now, when they talk about remodeling their home, you're like, oh god, that's terrible. I was like, I was begging for them to at least have some experience. Um, I had to, I didn't know anyone. Well, here's here's a story about how bad it was. I didn't know any investors. I wasn't from money, but I was living in Palo Alto. So I used to walk uh, to every coffee shop or I drive to San Francisco and I'd randomly go pitch every single person at the coffee shop Monday through Friday, telling them about Building Connected because I needed to raise capital. And I raised $250,000 doing that, just pitching random people at coffee shops. So, um, it's been a long journey and it's been a lot of struggles, but uh, it builds you up and it teaches you a lot of skills, much better than you would ever acquire getting an MBA. I hope you bought a lot of flat whites in return. <laughs> you were doing that racing. <laughs> what, so across everything, what's been the biggest challenge professionally or personally that you've faced on the journey of founding your own startup? So, Let's think about it. There's been a lot of unique challenges. Uh, I think the biggest challenges have always been uh, internal and battling like who you are as a person. And when you're the CEO, there is a lot of isolation and, and there can be some depression around it because you can't always be true, um, which is something with Edify, I'm trying intentionally to be more transparent and to be more open because it's a, it's too much pressure for any one person. So like with my leadership team, I actually try not to uh, hold anything back with them. So along the way, I think I think that that's been the biggest challenge is, you know, what can you share with your team? What are your real concerns versus when do you display this, you know, arrogance or confidence that you're gonna go and be a rocket ship where you know there are risk factors, right? But then you also have this other side, it's like, no, I have to lead by saying, we're gonna go do everything in the world. And so that tension, I think, is the most challenging part about being a CEO, is when do you show unbridled enthusiasm or when do you show true humility and, uh, 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 like, unveil your innermost uh, thoughts and feelings to your team mm -hmm. so that you build trust and confidence, that they know you're one of them and that they want to work and in, are, are inspired to work for someone that is, can be that open. So at Building Connected, was it more like whatever the weather, it was that we're going to make this work? And now are you like 
look, there is risk. We may not work, but I'm damn sure that I'll try my hardest to get us there. Yeah, uh, with Building Connected, um, the interesting thing was I was so much younger. So my uh, my appetite for risk was infinitely larger. So I used to live my 20s paycheck to paycheck, even though I made great money. I'd blow it all, either gambling or Vegas. And so like the... Yeah. the <laughs> all the time. <laughs> Every weekend, I'd just be broke. Um, but like the the fear of going broke, I didn't hold that. I had no conscious of it. I was like, you can't, that's actually one of the good things. It's why I think young entrepreneurs are, have such an advantage versus once you're later on in life is that you, you really have no, no real risk because you can't really get broker than broke. Like if you got zero yeah. in your checking, what are you going to do? No one's going to give you money. You can't spend it. Yeah. Debt. It's called debt. <laughs> Dustin. Yeah. I didn't have credit cards. So I just got rid of those too. No one to give me credit. Uh, yeah. So, um, I, I think that's the uh, the con. Uh, so in a lot of ways, I was a better entrepreneur because I could I could embrace risk more. But when with Edify, we're trying to build such a uh, we're trying to tackle such a large problem, which is looking at the whole pre-construction landscape, not just estimating, although that's our core competency, but working uh, looking at how people plan the built worlds. And um, if we're successful, we're going to build a very large company. And so I want to be in very intentional on how I structure it. So I want to mitigate risks early on and build the company the right way. So it has that foundation and the optionality to be a publicly traded company at some point, which is different um, than I did building Connected. Yeah, I've got, I have a few questions to spin off on that, but I suppose it ties in quite neatly when we had a conversation the other day you discussed intentional hiring and the importance of that. And I'm sure a lot of people listening won't know what that means. So can you just expand, I suppose, firstly on how your hiring changes at each stage from when you're, you know, two people to 200 people, but also maybe 20 years on, how has your 20 years, God, 10 years, apologies, <laughs> 10 15. years on. <laughs> 10 years on, how has your strategy towards hiring developed? Uh, I think first, um, I have a much bigger Rolodex today. So I, I am fortunate and blessed that um, so many people are coming to us with Edify that I know are just amazing. Um, and so that's that's been a real huge competitive advantage. And a lot of people from this space know that things that we're trying to accomplish are real problems in construction. But uh, I think that every startup has to understand uh, uh, what are their needs now and then what their needs are in the future and hire accordingly. A lot of people um, do, they do, they make one or two mistakes. They, they hire someone too early and give them a VP title where they're never going to be able to be a VP because they need to first learn from a, a, a VP or or they hire VPs when they don't ha have enough doers. Mm. And so those are traps that are very easy to fall into. Um, with Edify, we had a ton of product service area. So I did choose to hire true VP caliber individuals because we wanna focus on simplifying our user experience across our product service area. Um, I would have not done this if we're trying to build a product from the ground up. But because Edify was developed over five years um, inside a construction company before Mike and I took it and, and made it an independent company, um, it, it lent itself to bringing on very top talent to start thinking about how we could build the right software solution for uh, the industry. Um, but yeah, that's, that's like the classic problem I see people is uh, they think they're doing someone uh, a service is giving them a title when actually it's not doing them a service because they're not good because at some point down the road you're going to have to pay the piper and say hey we need to hire someone that actually knows what the fuck they're doing as a vp and and so then that's going to be a really uncomfortable situation and where you're like no you're you're more like a director or a manager at this point mm. so if you had to go between if you had one option to go for a younger executor or more of like a VP strategist, and you could only choose one in your 10 people, what are you going to go for? Uh, I think nine times out of 10, I would recommend to go with a, a younger doer. One of my best hires is a gentleman named uh, Nate Mahalovich. Shout out to you, Nate. 
um, who, who uh, has his own startup. I hired him when he was 25. He had no construction experience, but he was our first non-engineering hire. And now he's a VP caliber individual. So if you can be really good about finding a great doer with the caliber to level up over time, uh, that's going to be the best bang for your buck. Uh, but it's nine times out of 10, 10. And Edify, I feel like, was that one out of 10 where I think you really need seasoned veterans uh, for mm -hmm. this particular. And I think it's really obvious, at least for me, having spoken to so many people who have gone to Building Connected, the culture was just second to none, kind of in the same way when people speak about Procore. Maybe they leave for other reasons, but no one knocks the culture. So moving from a startup essentially to a scale up, how do you make sure that your core values ripple through the whole company and don't get diluted with more headcount? So uh, there is nothing I'm more proud of in my life today so far. And knock on wood, I, I hope that changes, you know, whether it's starting a family or whatnot, but uh, then building connected and the relationships and bonds that we formed. And I think the true positive impact we had on a lot of individuals. Uh, I'm still contacted today constantly with people telling me um, it was the greatest place they've ever worked and they hope they can experience it again. And I hope with Edify, we can have that same experience for every individual that comes here. It's kind of funny because I'm working on this draft email. We've had so many new people start. I was working on the flight and I'm going to work on it today. I'm going to hit send, but it's it's to send out just a refresher because we're so new that we haven't even codified our onboarding process and working yeah. with some HR folks. But uh, just to reiterate what, are, what our values are and why those are the values we hold true in this organization. Um, so with that, if I do want to talk about values more and, um, and treat people according to the values that we said are important to this organization, um, I think that with, with any company, if, if they believe in the leader and they believe in that lead, that leader has uh, a capacity and the vision and the attitude to be successful, then the positivity will permeate from there. And um, that's infectious. So I, I am the biggest bull in the world about what we're trying to do and what we're trying to accomplish. And I think that uh, my co-founder, Mike Navarro, is as well. I think our leadership team is as well. So we're getting mercenaries, not missionaries, or missionaries, not mercenaries. I don't want to hire people because they want to make a bunch of money. I want to hire people because they believe that we're going to accomplish something beautiful and bold and, and earth shattering and going to change this space in such a meaningful way. And if you can hire those people that believe in your vision and you talk about your vision through the hiring process, you're going to be able to uh, uh, federate out who is the right people for your organization. Uh, and that's going to be a culture that's really special. And in that interview process to get those leaders on board, what are you putting them through to make sure that you know you're not going to make a wrong hire at such a fundamental stage? Usually the first question I ask, um, and, and it depends if I'm the first person interviewing or if I'm the last, um, I want to know why they're here. Why, why are they talking to me at this point? Because um, I'm hoping they tell me about uh, what, what, what do they want out of life? Like, is this just a job or do you want something greater in life? Do you want to learn how to be a leader? Do you want to learn how to be part of a successful organization? Do you want to learn how to be a team player? Do you, do you believe in the mission? What do you know about Edify that you think differentiates it from any other startup that you're talking to? And if they can't articulate that and they don't need a perfect answer. A lot of people don't know what's in life and it depends on the position. Um, th then I have a little bit of worry. But when when someone comes in and like, uh, I'll give an example. We just hired someone in support and, and the person was honest and said, I don't I don't know my career path. And I said, you know what? I, I can guarantee you this because I know he believes in what we're doing because of his background and what he's seen. I, I can guarantee you this. By the time you're ready to depart Edify, you will know what options you have and you will be better pre prepared to go out and realize those. And, and that's, that's so that's kind of how, how I started. Well, now we've just given a spoiler alert for anyone who ever interviews you with you. So you're <laughs> welcome, everyone. You're welcome. It's true. I, um, I want to rewind a bit and there's so much to look back on in your career, but 
I know we mentioned off record 20s, you were having a lot of fun pre-building Connected. What like what's been driving you, I suppose, towards this success? So flipping the question onto you that you ask other people, like why are you doing all of this? It's a really good question. Sometimes I feel like I don't know the answer. Sometimes I know the answer and don't want to admit it. Uh, to get a little Say personal, it. safe yeah. space. To get a little personal, my I grew up in a highly, highly clever, uh, uh, competitive family. And um, I would say the bar uh, for what success was, was always uh, higher than I could attain. And so it, um, my, my, my mother and father raised two outstanding uh, sons. Uh, my brother actually ended up going to the NFL. He won state in wrestling. Um, he's now a coach at Oregon State. Um, so highly successful in the athletic competition. I was never quite as good as him. And so just to see your younger brother have all these accolades and you were just like, you know, you're like all league or, but you're not all state or all nation um, or all American as he was. Uh, it, it, it builds a fire under you over time to be, be like, you know what, maybe I couldn't compete there, but I have a different attribute that, you know, I'm better at my brother in how I think about things and process information. And so maybe my, my gift to uh, society should be realized by, and I was lucky enough to find it, but starting companies and thinking about how you build organizations. And I, I think I, I have a lot of natural talent there. So that I'm very fortunate in that respect. So the main driver, I suppose, is it, because there must have been a switch suddenly, otherwise you would have been popping off startups from the age of 19. But is it like, what is it about you're hitting your thirties and you're like, right, I'm going to go and create one of the most kick-ass contact startups of all time. <laughs> well, I was living in Palo Alto. So uh, I moved to Palo Alto for work and uh, this is circa 2010. And literally I was, I was so broke. Uh, my good friend Tim was going to Minlo Atherton, which is a very small college in, in Minlo. And so I had to live in his dorm for uh, a while until I rented a room from this woman who was renting out five of her bedrooms on, on Middlefield Road right near uh, Phil's Coffee. But uh, when, I was, when I was living in Palo Alto, I started reading TechCrunch. And then like I talked to people at coffee shops. And I'm like, holy shit, this is uh, this whole cloud thing, this SaaS thing. This all makes a ton of sense. And like you reflect on this industry and you're like, you start reflecting, you know, anyone who doesn't think about their age is crazy. But, you know, 28, 29, going to be 30. You start thinking, well, what do I really want out of life? Because I, it, what I'm doing right now is not sustainable. And so um, you start writing down like your goals and then you're like, okay, how do I attain them? And uh, you put down some childish things. Now I was not successful putting down all my childish behaviors. And certainly I've, I've indulged them over the years, but um, yeah, it was more just the atmosphere. Pa Palo Alto at that time was the most unique place in the entire world. For anyone who could have been a part of that, uh, or was a part of it should count themselves as like you hit the lottery if you had an opportunity to participate in Palo Alto from 2000 uh, after the crash 2006 or 7 through 2015 like everything changed and it was a great thing to be a part of amazing and is there is there a particular piece of advice that you've received or someone else across your career which you've just like stuck with you when things are going well and things are going tough you think, okay, I'll cling on to that. I, I think a lot about my mentor. His name's Jim Corbett. He's uh, he's one of the most amazing individuals I've I've ever met. He founded a, a, a something called Sacramento Entrepreneurial Academy, which I uh, attended when I was in college. So every Saturday I would go there, and we reconnected when I started with Building Connected. He's the founder of a uh, uh, company, uh, Bay Equities. Um, he was the chairman. They just got acquired by Redfin for like, I don't know, 130 million. Uh, but he's had multiple, many, many successful endeavors. Uh, he would, one, his, his favorite saying is something that I believe in more than anything. And now that I, I see how it's happening with Building Connected, it gives me a sense of pride that I never knew I would have. He used to say, 
entrepreneurs replicate themselves. And what does that really mean? It means that when you bring people into your, this is why I believe in capitalism so much, it means when you bring people into your organization, it's not just helping them, helping your business, but you are teaching them how to build something from scratch. And if you are doing that well, they're going to replicate this and build companies on their own. And this is going to propagate and build a healthy economy and market. And it's going to be something really special. So, um, you know, from him, I just got the, I would talk to him all the time and it was always just doesn't, whether it succeeds or fails, it's, it's more about the journey and what you learn from it. But, um, you know, cause it might take you 10 pot shots or it might take you one, but building connectors is my first one. Um, uh, it, and so realize that failure is part of the process in order to create something successful. And so as long as you're going through it and building and doing the right behaviors, uh, eventually you will find something that does well. Um, as long as you're also actually solving a problem, a lot yeah. of people, are not actually solving a problem. They might at best be treating like an annoyance. And so if you want people to really pay you for your software, you better solve a freaking problem. <laughs> and you know, the 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 way to evaluate a business is okay, how many people does this problem affect and how painful is that problem? And that's the simple way to address the total addressable market of your of your business. What if it doesn't address that many people, but the problem is so painful? Uh, then uh, you could have a, a a company like Snowflake. That's pretty good. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> touche. You mentioned failures there, and it's such a common theme. I think amongst anyone successful, not just startup entrepreneurs, but it doesn't matter. It's the Nelson Mandela quote, I think. It doesn't matter if you win or lose. I'm going to butcher it. There's something at the end, which is beautiful. Um, it's about what you learn from the failures. That's the end of it. What is one failure which has just gone like horrifically wrong for you and you thought, well, maybe you didn't think I'm going to give up, but you brinked on the borderline of thinking this is a big blow to bounce back from? Uh, that really had to do with the where. So after I left Autodesk, I was brought in to be the CEO of a company called Aware, which has an amazing offering for both consumers and enterprises to monitor indoor air quality. And um, we, we struck a partnership, it's gonna be a weird story. We struck a partnership with a crypto exchange called Planet Watch, which uh, Planet Watch um, would reward people with tokens for sharing our aware device air quality data in their house. The problem was people were just buying our, our our monitors to just earn these tokens. It wasn't building a sustainable business. And so our revenues jacked so much, like we were selling 5 million a month, like an insane amount of product. Um, to manage a business when uh, the, the, the mechanism for your sales is not sustainable is incredibly challenging because you have too much capital coming in and you you don't have the right means to deploy it to work on what, what we should have been working on, which was we were building um, an enterprise division where we uh, outfit uh, office spaces with Aware under a SaaS subscription, which we could then um, start uh, putting inputs into the building management system to act actuate the HVAC in case there was particulates. And so um, Aware Aware failed for a variety of reasons. One of them was completely supply chain related. Our cost, our bomb cost to deliver any product went from $72 to 154. It literally doubled in like the span of a month. And, um, uh, but uh, I think in hindsight, we sh if, if I had been better at understanding how uh, sustainable what we were doing was, then maybe I could have recalibrated and said, any anything here, we're just treating as icing on the cake, and we're not going to get to detach from what our what our true uh, north star is. And so the lesson I'm taking from that, 
the reinforces something that I also learned at Building Connected because the with Building Connected, I knew that if we won the GCs from a bidding perspective and just continue to build that, we, we could eventually monetize subcontractors. They forced me to, not force me, rather, they encouraged me to start monetizing subcontractors too early, uh, in my opinion. So my, what I'm getting at is that the best lesson um, uh, I've learned is that be relentless on what you believe is your true North Star to get where the industry is today and take them to your vision for the future. And unless someone gives you such compelling evidence to deviate from it, don't do it. And it's really easy to do. And people get lost all the time. I see it in so many companies. They're, tr they're playing whack-a-mole on different problems. They're trying to solve them. Like, the hell does this have to do with the company you're trying to build? Nothing. But is that like diversifying your risk? Because what if you're following a North Star, clouds go over the star, turns out the star was like Jupiter or Venus, and then at least if you had some other stars floating around, you can pivot. Uh, true. And, and I did I did leave the caveat, like if you get some really compelling information that forces you to deviate, then by all means. But for the most part, a lot of people just listen to a customer, make one suggestion, and they're like, let's build that. And that's not the right way to operate when you want to build a really big business. And at the end of the day, uh, if you want to be diversified and hedge your bets, don't do a startup that raises venture capital. Do do something else and build a, you know, a, a, a uh, a bootstrapped company and you that's a good playbook but if you want to build a high scale company you don't have the resources for that you you need to focus on a vision that's going to help you attain that and you won't reach the scale and the growth metrics that you're going to need um, to raise your subsequent rounds of capital um, with the way venture works if in doubt north star got yeah. it <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm glad you mentioned vc because i want you to put a vc cap on for a second so I have a ton of candidates who maybe don't come from a venture capital background, but they're asking me, how can I pivot into this? And like, you know, that's not an easy transition. On the other side, a ton of people looking to raise, it has become a harder environment recently. So given you've sat on both sides of the fences, what advice would you give those who are wanting to raise funds from VCs or looking to try and get their career somewhat in that direction? Okay, so on the first first uh, uh, cohort, the people that are trying to raise capital from VCs, um, a lot of people think that, uh, that a lot, there's a lot of misconceptions on what it takes to raise capital from venture uh, from VCs, and I certainly held those to be true for a long time. And now I'm fortunate enough that raising capital is not all that hard, but I, I've learned a lot of the tricks. Venture is about hitting it big. And so when you talk to VCs, you can raise capital on a napkin if people believe that you're going to take their capital and give them 10 to 20 X return. So if you want to raise venture capital, get really good at inspiring people to believe in your vision. But if you can t sell that you are the right person to execute on this vision, and even if that vision only has like, you know, a, a, a 10 or 20% chance of realizing it, that's okay. Because the expected outcome, the mathematical equation, when they, if, if everything you're saying is true, um, is 20x, then who cares if it's only 10 or 20% likelihood, the expected outcome is so great. So um, if you want to raise venture capital, the first thing is work on how you um, inspire people to believe in what you're selling. Now, a lot of people um, are solving a pain or a nuance, which is fine. That's what, how you meet the industry where it is, but you have to have a vision for meeting the industry where it is and taking the industry to the, to the future state. You can't just build for the future state and you can't because you won't meet the industry and you can't just meet the industry with one pain point and not have a vision for what, what the, what, where your uh, final destination is. So those are, those are the, the two biggest things in terms of like, networking and how you meet these these venture capitalists uh it, it's really not all that hard actually if you go to homebrew which did my seed round um uh, i i'm their first cold email investment but i don't know if i don't know if they've done another one they're a fantastic venture fund um uh, uh here here is what you do here's the secret sauce email vcs this is how you do a cold email 
tell them what you're working on and what you're going to accomplish in the next six months and then come back to them when you accomplish that they will take a meeting with you that is what i literally did with homebrew oh yeah i emailed uh hunter walk said hey i'm gonna go do these this is my thesis for the space emailed it back he said come meet with us we we got a deal done in like two months that's great are there going to be people out there smashing their head against the wall who've been trying to raise for two years like Dustin? If you're looking for one-on-one -on -one consultancy, please call Dustin at yeah. any given moment after this podcast. It's really simple. Okay, well, I think that's because you're a bit of a boss man at doing it, but I do take your advice at just keeping it simple and prove it. Don't give all the talk. But then yeah, at the yeah. same time, you've got to give the talk so that they buy in. Well, uh... Talk the talk, yeah. walk the walk. You, you have to, to be go. a sale, you have to be a salesman and you have to back up your sales with, you know, data or facts or something. Uh, now you asked a second question, which was how do you get into VC? And I've I've held the angel investor hat, I've held the VC hat for a short period of time while I was at Suffolk Technologies. Um, it's a really tough climate to get into venture. And to, to be quite frank, I see the venture capital uh, community as being very dilutive of their talent right now. And so um, I think there's going to be a reckoning. I think that a lot of venture funds are going to be washed out in the next two to three years. I think that there's a ton of people that thought they were VCs that don't know what they're doing. So I, I wouldn't encourage people to want to go into the venture Fancy capital. Fancy naming any names or? <laughs> Not naming names right now. There's a bunch of terrible, there's a bunch of terrible VCs out there. They, the, like, they don't know what it takes to start a business. They don't know what it takes to operate a business. They don't know like what, how to, how to differentiate a good entrepreneur from a bad entrepreneur. They completely invest on who invested before, or they invest on what school did you go to or what networks or who endorsed you? Like there's so many bad VCs out there that I think that there's going to be a, a big reckoning in the future. So bottom line is avoid the VCs right now if you can. Go, go <laughs> for the startups. I don't think, they're, I don't think they're, <laughs> they're a good bet right now. Okay, well, we've been looking into the futuristic bull right now a little bit, so we might as well carry on on that stream of thought. Mm -hmm. If we were to be taking this beautiful podcast conversation 10 years down the line, not only would you be 51, oh my Lord, but where would the like where's the construction tech space going to be then what do you think will be the like huge breakthrough the biggest challenge kind of impossible to say but i want to know what you think so in 10 years from now um if edify is successful uh you'll see a convergence between estimating and design and it's going to be done simultaneously where you're going to be able to define what the objectives are of the project, and that's gonna both estimate the cost and provide you the designs. And then you'll be able to, generative AI or machine learning is gonna be able to tell you what options you have to tweak this. But theoretically, you're gonna be able to have like, hey, if I'm doing a multifamily development, what is my, optional, uh, uh, my optimal pro forma analysis for this lot that I'm looking at? with real designs with real costs on what it's going to take to build uh, uh, so you're going to see this huge uh convergence between design which is just done in revit and autocad right and estimating which is done primarily in excel or desktop applications they don't talk to each other instead it's going to be one solution that helps you understand both the design and cost fundamentally which is going to be really cool and is that going to be beyond just North America? I'm hoping. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. yeah. When are you coming to London? We're ready for you. We're ready. <laughs> I can't. I can't wait to come to London. I think it's a fantastic city. So, uh, I, uh, you guys have that whole structure with quantity surveyors that I still don't. I still don't understand like why there is this quantity surveyor that's removed. I'll come teach you London. Come <laughs> over. Come over. We'll give a one-on-one -on -one okay. tutorial. <laughs> Okay, so Dustin, we probably haven't got that long left, but normally I ask people about their Time guilty. Flown. I know I could go on forever. We could go on till you're 51, but I don't know if my laptop would, <laughs> would hold up. Question: What's one thing which you feel like no one knows about you? I've never been asked that question before. So, uh, oh, you need to get in therapy. They ask you that the whole time. <laughs> uh one thing that no one knows about me 
Um, I don't know. I, I'm pretty much an open book. I feel like a lot of people know too much about me. Uh, I, I, I'm struggling to come up with a good answer for you. And, and that sounds so lame. No, not lame. You've been golden. We can park that if it's too hard for right now. <laughs> I, I really don't have something that I would be like, no one really knows about me. Um, yeah, I, I'm not coming up with something good. I, I wish. You I know what? Every answer you've answered so well, you're allowed one pass. That can be your pass. <laughs> Thank you. Next question. If you're going to have one pump up song for your sales kickoff, what's it going to be? Oh, for my sales kickoff, uh, probably like bringing it old school, like regulators or something, like something just really gangster rap ghetto. Okay, I'm there for that. <laughs> I'm there for that. Okay, what other things can I claw out of you for our last few minutes? Fine, what's your guilty pleasure? I do want to know now. Oh, uh, ice cream. I love ice cream. Uh, and then like, I love, I love playing poker. I don't get to play very often anymore. I love gambling. I love playing poker. I love That's it. where the series A is going guys. <laughs> <laughs> I just funnel it to my gambling. All on addiction. black. <laughs> Done that quite a few times in my life. Oh my God, Dustin, this has been such a pleasure, really. It's really good chatting with you. Oh, thank you. I will press stop.